So um, putting pedestrians at the heart of transport planning. Walking often comes tacked on at the end after cycling, so cycling and we're and walking and usually when you get cycling and walking, you then get a list of things about cycling and my belief is that this is because walking is not well understood either as a form of transport or as a form of using public space. So in recent years, awareness of pedestrians has very slowly grown. When we first started Oxford Pedestrians Association 26 years ago, in fact, nearly 27 now, pedestrians didn't even figure. They were never mentioned anywhere. Um, but locally and nationally and in every document, pedestrians and walking is now at least mentioned. Um, however, there are other policies which have carried more weight than considering pedestrians like economic growth, development, improvements to junctions. So as a result of that, pedestrian space is almost always too narrow and very regularly widely encroached on by signs, poles, bins, bus shelters, huge puddles, parked vehicles, cycle lanes, parked cycles, etc. You name it, it will be put on the pavement because no one wants to get in the way of cars. No one wants to get in the way of cycles, although cycles people don't mind quite as much as getting in the way of cars. When it comes to pedestrians, people know that people that pedestrians will walk round absolutely everything. They'll go out into the road, they'll squeeze together. They're a bit like water. They'll run around things. And so it's very easy to ignore the needs of pedestrians. So the problem with the way that pedestrians are perceived in planning is that it seems to me when I look at any plan that planners conceive of transport as moving objects of a certain width and speed. So if pedestrians are designed for, they get a space wide enough for two pedestrians single file to pass one another. And that is really genuinely considered a minimum in planning terms. But because of the way pavements are used, people generally end up with a lot less space than that. So and they, so but the point that is very rarely considered is that pedestrians are not thin cars and they're not slow cycles. They are not just transport. To walk is to be in a public space. And in public space, there are wheelchair users, double buggies, dogs, children, people who need an arm to hold, people who hold hands, groups of people, people meeting, people waiting for buses, and people doing lots of other things. So in public space, people need to have space to stop and talk to one another, to meet one another, and for children to explore their environment as they walk along. It doesn't work if you're walking along in single file. So, and in addition, in order to walk, you need to be able to breathe properly and deeply. But if, as in Oxford, the air stinks and is toxic, you can't actually breathe deeply. It's not comfortable we all automatically start breathing less deeply when the air is full of exhaust. And the air is full of the sound of motoring. During the lockdown, one of the things I noticed in the silent city, as well as the songs of birds and the scent of cherry blossoms, was that if one car was coming, you could hear it a mile away and you could hear it after it had passed you for a good few minutes. I hadn't realised how much noise a single motorised vehicle makes until the lockdown. And since the lockdown, I've realised that pedestrians just live with a very unpleasant wall of sound and a very unpleasant scent of the air. So if we want to increase walking, the whole environment needs to be tackled as well as thought given to what do pedestrians actually need. So if pedestrians were at the centre of transport planning, as documents are now saying, which is a wonderful thing to hear, we would start when looking at public space with how wide a space can we give them if we minimise space for motorists? So for example, as on Frideswide Square, 
The space for motorised vehicles has been minimised. It is as narrow as it can possibly be and buses and lorries and vans go through it and they do not need to put wheels on the pavement. They manage it. But then you go into Hythe Bridge Street, Park End Street, Oxpens Road, and I went out with a measure tape and I measured all these roads and there is no street in the vicinity with lanes as narrow as they are on Fryds Wide Square. But if you start saying we could give pedestrians more space, people say, oh, you couldn't possibly. They look at Hythe Bridge Street and they say it's so narrow already, but they are not seeing that it's wider in terms of space given to pedestrians than Fryds Wide Square. So the starting point, if we were putting pedestrians at the heart of transport planning, would be how much space can we give them? They would be thought of first and not as they are, I believe, pretty much last. Secondly, all pedestrian routes need to be level, unobstructed, wheelchair accessible, which means raised crossings on desire lines and crossings not round a corner and up a bit and lights that respond immediately to pedestrians so that you're not backing up on the pavement. And it's a shame if I can't share these photos because they, they, they're photos I've taken walking around Oxford and they show the issues in, um, in action. There's also the way that pavements are used unconsciously as a dumping ground for all kinds of things. And this needs to be made conscious. So if we were going to put pedestrians at the heart of transport planning, signs to workmen would not be automatically plonked in the middle of pavements where people walk around them not expecting any better. And um, hedges would not overhang. People would not park with two wheels on the pavement or even in many cases the whole vehicle on the pavement. Cycle stands and scooter parks could be put in X car parking spaces in the road. So um, it says your video is highlighted for everyone in the meeting. What does that mean? Does, does that Sorry, mean? I just made you a bit bigger. Yeah, that's oh, good. made me a bit bigger. OK, yeah, that's yeah. much better. OK. Um, so if pedestrians and cyclists were prioritised over drivers, the whole street would be designed completely differently. As it is, whilst we talk about prioritising cycling and walking, and we talk about public transport use, and I, I don't deny that these things have improved in, in over the years, but on the ground for pedestrians, they have not improved really. They have not improved at all. So um, if we were to start with pedestrians at the heart, we would start by designing streets for pedestrians and the middle of the road where you get the best view and where you get the le most level, best drained bit of the highway would actually be where pedestrians and cyclists go. And we'd have motorised vehicles on one side, perhaps. So it almost goes without saying that parking on pavements should be immediately tackled and that um, and that public space needs to be completely reimagined really rather than thinking that pedestrians are catered for by saying well we'll have a two meter wide minimum um, pavement at the edges. Our overarching principles are that we, we need three meter wide pavements minimum really and in, th in three meters two wheelchair users can pass one another in dignity and comfort. With a three metre pavement, if people dump bins and bus shelters and all the other paraphernalia and poles and everything that goes on pavements, you may still have enough space for wheelchair users and walkers. However, we would like to see it as an overarching principle that pavements should be free of clutter and not just be the place where people put everything. We would like to see pavement extensions across every crossing and raised junctions where there are um, four way streets meeting. So, for example, if you look at the top of Hythe Bridge Street and the bottom of George Street, that is a junction that has been remodeled several times, but it's never worked for pedestrians. It's been remodeled with managing the traffic 
better and making it easier to cycle in mind. But when you look at that junction, it is incredibly wide. It's a huge amount of space. It's difficult to get across it, even in the time that's allocated. So pedestrians back up on the pavement waiting to cross and then nobody can walk along the pavement and they spill out into the road. So the third thing would be that light controlled crossings need to be more responsive. It, it, you can wait for ages to cross after you've pressed the button and there has been a policy to make light controlled crossings quicker to respond. But it, it, it for a little while it works and then they kind of trail off and they start to take longer. I would also say that if it, if the county is serious about putting pedestrians at the forefront or in the middle or considered first, that every single person designing and drawing the plans and creating the new spaces needs to get out there and walk the routes because it doesn't work unless you actually walk the routes. We went up to Barton Park to look at how are the principles applied in the newest development in Oxford City. And to our dismay, really, the pavements were all curved so that people can swing around them in motorised vehicles, which makes crossing take much longer. So if pedestrians were in the heart of transport planner, this, the corners of streets would be angled. It makes a shorter crossing space and it acts as a, a form of transport planning. We found that there were curbs where people couldn't in wheelchairs, people in wheelchairs could not cross on desire lines because of the way the curb was. And conversely, where people were meant to want to cross, the pavement sloped right across their width. So our wheelchair users tipped sideways. So, and these are, this is the way things have been done for a long time. I think um, overall, what the message I want people to take, and especially the message I want the County Council to take, is that we talk about pedestrians as a form of transport, but we need to actually come from a starting point of thinking, uh, what in addition to walking in straight lines do people need public space for? And what happens if two people meet and stop to chat on a two meter wide pavement? We need to talk, start with what things are really like and build on it. And what we've been saying recently is that there is almost no pavement in Oxford city centre that couldn't be widened. And there is almost no pavement that couldn't be made more level or less obstructed. I would like to share these photos and I'm wondering if anyone can tell me how to do that. Um, there's a button here that says share content and then it says presenter mode. If I click content only, can I just share the photos which I've got ready in a folder at the bottom of the screen? If 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 below presenter mode, uh, there's screen. So if you click on screen, you will be basically sharing whatever is on your computer screen. OK, so I'm going to run these photos past people and I'm going to give a small commentary as I do it. And these are photos of how things are, but I think they flag up the kind of problem that we're facing. So let's see if this works. Am I now sharing my screen? Yes, we are seeing okay. your email right now. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So this is a typical crossing. This is the crossing on the main walking route between Oxford Railway Station and Oxford City Centre. This is a site you can see at almost any time of the day. The pavement blocked by the high numbers of people waiting to cross, people starting to cross against the lights and no room for the people waiting. This is Beaumont Street on a quite a quiet day, actually. And when you look at this, you can see that there is room for a line of parked cars on either side. You can only see that down at the bottom, but there is actually room for a line of parked cars on either side. And in the middle, there's enough space for three lanes of traffic. So the road is five lanes of traffic wide, really. And the pedestrians are given a comparatively very narrow space. That is an example of literal marginalisation. This is a very typical picture, I'm sorry to say. 
This happens to be the approach to West Oxford Community Centre, but it could be absolutely anywhere. People parking on the pavement, which means pedestrians can get past, and this is why it doesn't get much attention. People can get past in single file, and pedestrians are not used to being considered, and so they won't complain about this. But it's not actually, it makes, it degrades walking. It makes walking into something which is just something you do because you have to, and not something you will do because you want to. Drivers can sit side by side, and cyclists can go side by side, but pedestrians are far too often expected to go in single file. This is Hyde Bridge Street on a typical Saturday. If you look down Hyde Bridge Street, you can see the extraordinary number of pedestrians that use this route and the cycle in the middle of the road, which is um, implies that cyclists have priority. But what actually happens is the road is this main route between the station and the city centre is actually completely chock a block with cars and vans, but mostly cars. There are no buses on this route. And everyone else, again, is squeezed to the side and it is really, really congested. We talk about congestion and people think of, um, of road traffic congestion. People very rarely think of pedestrian congestion as a problem. But if you're meant to be socially distancing or if you want to get somewhere in a hurry, it is a real issue. And if you step into the road, you get in the way of cyclists or drivers and everyone hates you. Sometimes there's no alternative. This is George Street, walking up George Street towards the city centre, another part of the main walking route between Oxford Railway Station and Oxford City Centre. I think that when these parking spaces were put in, someone must have just measured the length of a, one of these stands and thought there was plenty of room left for pedestrians. But in fact, when you put in cycle racks, you take up a good another half metre to metre, depending if the bike has a trailer. So this is why we say cycle racks should go in the road and we should take out car parking to make room for cycle parking and let the pavements be for pedestrians. This is Broad Street which is um, a, a, a pretty much pedestrianised street, but certainly at this end. And this is what happens in Broad Street. Drivers come up, they want to nip through. On this occasion, they found they couldn't. So they're all really slow and turning and obstructing the buses turning out on the right. And I took this photo because it's actually pretty typical. This is George Street without the traffic. And just to show the number of pedestrians that use this street and how actually tolerant pedestrians are, how they will fit into a very minimal space. I think somebody's scraping and clinking something. Um, this is to show how there is not enough space for pedestrians in a very highly um, pedestrian city. And finally, uh, It's another picture of Hythe Bridge Street. Again, I was just astonished when I went out with my new camera to see the numbers of pedestrians. And I think like, you know, despite being focused on pedestrians and pedestrian issues for 26, 27 years, it was only recently I started taking photos and realizing just how many of us there are. So I want to end on um, a, a positive note, which is talking about the pedestrian pound. This is I'm going to now let's see how do I get back to teams and I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, is that it? Do I need to do something else or is that it? You have to click on the X on the right. On up, the upper X right. On the right. Um, yeah, just just next to your. Uh, no, not the one, not the one. Uh, let's get rid of that. OK, just next to the leave button on the left. There's an um, sort of screen with an X in the middle. Sorry, uh, sorry, so uh, upper right corner this one. here. That's Stop the one. sharing. Yeah, yes. great. Thank you. Thanks very much that, that I'm glad I managed to show you those. I want to end talking about the pedestrian pound only because it's it needs to be more 
talked about and it needs to be more in documents because when we talk about cycling and walking, we very rarely talk about um, the pos what can happen very positively when pedestrians are given enough space. People get very frightened, traders and motoring um, representatives especially, about closing off streets or making more space for cyclists and pedestrians and they say we're going to go bankrupt, we won't get passing trade. But um, the uh, National Livable Streets has done a lot of work on how actually there's an initial downturn when you close off streets to motorised traffic and then the pedestrian pound kicks in because you've got such a nicer area that people want to come and they want to stay. We're always talking in Oxford about how tourists don't stay and maybe we need more hotels etc. My belief is it's not a shortage of hotels we have, it's a lack of public space and it's a lack of pleasant public space and Fried's Wide Square and Broad Meadow and Broad Meadow was temporary but I think it's going to be built on. Those are examples of what we need more of if pedestrians are at the heart of transport planning. Thank you for allowing me to share that.